Good afternoon or good morning from um, to wherever you're joining us today. I extend a very warm welcome um, to the audience, which is, which is just coming in right now. I see um, 11 participants, but um, we had 51 registrations. So I hope while I am speaking here for this introduction, our audience will increase. I extend um, a warm welcome also to the panelists, um, Helen Schwenken, Salim Nabi, and Anila Noor. Um, and yeah, once again, um, welcome to our webinar, Contestation over Migration and Rights in the Context of Forced Displacement. How do we study it? My name is Katja Mielke. I'm a senior researcher at the Bonn International Center for Conflict Studies. BICC, which hosts today's podium discussion. This event takes place within the cooperation project Forced Migration and Refugee Studies, Networking and Knowledge Transfer. It, is, um, it has this acronym FFBT. As the title suggests, this project does not have an empirical agenda itself, but with its networking and knowledge transfer agenda, it aims to strengthen interdisciplinary forced migration and refugee studies within Germany and internationally. FFVT is jointly run by the Bonn International Center for Conflict Studies, the Center for Human Rights Erlangen Nuremberg, the German Development Institute here in Bonn, and also the Institute for Migration Research and Intercultural Studies, EMIS in Osnabrück. And the funding uh, for the project is provided by the German Federal Ministry of Education and Research, the BMBF, for which we are really um, grateful, which we appreciate. So with this podium discussion today, we are actually bridging two FFVT events that were organized or are organized by BICC. Um, I think some of the members here in the audience, they might remember that we had a discussion last year on perspectives of peace and conflict research regarding forced migration studies. And in this event, um, actually the topic of political contention over migration and rights of refugees came up and was identified as yeah, important and significant. And we noted a lack of empirical studies and conceptual pondering on forced migration from the angle of political mobilization. So that is why the workshop tomorrow will actually focus exactly on this issue and provide ample room for the discussion of case studies, who the actors are, which resulting processes of political mobilization in the context of forced migration we see. And now this panel complements this agenda and precedes the workshop with a focus on the rather pedagogical and epistemological dimension of contentiousness in forced migration research. So how do we study phenomena where uh, mobility, migration, and rights of forcibly displaced people are contested and struggled over? Are we asking the right questions? What have been blind spots in the study of political mobilization along these issues? And finally, how can both the gap between academia and the subjects of study that, of course, not only include people on the move, but also their supporters, policymakers, adversaries, and then the transfer gap into the policymaking realm, how can they be better bridged in order to enhance refugees' rights and mitigate societal contention about migration? I'm particularly glad to um, have an excellent um, yeah, panel composition speakers today here to discuss these issues, actually. Um, all three panelists are from a very highly interdisciplinary background of um, training, working, and researching. And I would like to introduce them now um, in alphabetical order. So Salem Nabi, I would like to uh, welcome you again uh, very warmly. Salem has uh, researched the refugee situation on the Greek island Lesbos as an independent researcher and migrant since 2016, while also living there. And also today he's joining us from Lesbos from his little um, yeah, apartment there, I guess, or office. Um, yeah. You can tell us later uh, the details. So Salem describes himself as an activist researcher who has focused empirically on different aspects of refugee struggles, from basic uh, needs such as nutrition to institutional questions such as legal and asylum procedures and related challenges like the criminalization of refugee struggles and legal proceedings 
against refugee activists and refugee mobilizations. His most recent works have touched on the intersection of migration and anti-authoritarian movements and the concept of affirmative biopolitics. Other research interests of his include feminist approaches, solidarity versus humanitarianism in refugee settings on Europe's borders, subjectivities, and from a methodological epistemological angle, he is a proponent of radical interventions in the academy. Then uh, I would like to uh, welcome Anila Nur. Anila, she is currently uh, FFVT fellow at BICC and uh, has a refugee background from Pakistan. She is one of 10 members of the Migration Expert Group at the European Union Commission representing the common interest of migrants and refugees. Thus, as an activist, her agenda is to influence high-level policymaking towards refugees and migrants. And one of Anila's main concerns is to work for an interdisciplinary understanding of gender discourses at the intersection of social justice and migration to ensure meaningful participation of especially female refugees and migrants in debates that concern their lives. She advocates to combine research advocacy and policy debates to analyze and streamline complex social processes that can provide concrete solutions towards achieving social justice. Then I would like to also welcome Helen Schwenken. Um, Helen is Professor of Sociology, Migration and Society at the University of Osnabrück and Director of the Institute of Migration Research and Intercultural Studies, IMIS. Um, she comes from a political science background and has subsequently ventured into several interdisciplinary fields, in particular migration research, social movement studies and knowledge production. And cross-cutting these fields is her strong focus on gender also. She has published on different aspects of protests against deportations and from a methodological angle also reflections on participatory research. And Helen leads several research projects in these fields. I maybe just want to mention one relevant um, to today's topic where she recently published um, the findings that is a project titled from refugee support to escape aid, uh, refugee protection as a conflicting issue in the German migration regime and the role of civil society initiatives. I'm sure we will probably hear more about this project in just a bit. And now before we start with the first round of discussion, I would um, maybe also to the audience um, just mention a brief technical information. Today, we are in a webinar modus. Um, that means we are recording and um, that also means you can interact with our panelists uh, via the question and comments function. Um, that is below also the F&A, if you have the German or Q&A uh, in the English menu. Um, that means um, the raising hand function that you might be used from other Zoom events that is disabled um, and your comments will also not be visible to others, but only to the organizers and the panelists. Uh, nevertheless, I strongly really encourage you to use this Q&A, F&A function for comments and remarks throughout the podium um, because my colleagues and I will already try to look at your questions and maybe cluster them ahead of um, the open discussion section and um, yeah, the procedure now will be um, the following. We will have three rounds of initial questions to the panelists and then we open up um, for questions and comments from, from the audience thereafter. Yeah, and um, without much further ado, I would like to um, start the first round of the podium and I would like to ask Helen first and then maybe Salem and then Anila. Um, to sketch out your actual individual approach to the, today's topic, that is the displacement related contestation over migration and rights. So what aspects um, have you focused on in the framework of your projects in your capacity as a knowledge transmitter at the university? And maybe you could also share, uh, yeah, maybe which interdisciplinary um, disciplinary debates have inspired you. Um, yeah, over to you, Helen, thanks. Thank you very much um, also to speak in this very nice panel and with so interesting colleagues and um, maybe I, I just 
go back for a while, not um, like in, in like where I started intellectually, and that was not really as a researcher, but as an activist. Um, like um, I think that many like researchers in the field, both in migration studies, but also in social movement studies, um, have this um, combined identity of being an activist and then studying and having the chance to do a PhD and maybe to continue. And um, so also the feeling of responsibility, uh, what, what it means to produce knowledge, also to be very sensitive for one's own position, like in either field. I think this is an important perspective when we talk about the field um, of contestations in, and that makes sometimes also the difference between uh, like when we will come, I think in one of the rounds also to gaps and critiques. Um, so um, how do you maneuver in a field and what does responsibility, what does ethical research mean, but not just to, to um, celebrate the activist researcher, but also to see um, problems that come with this um, dual positionality in the field. And um, I, I thought of going back to the early 2000s when I did my PhD on a field of contestations that has been in the news since two weeks very extremely, that's the channel and the migrant and refugee death. Um, so I did um, a study um, like on Sangat and Calais and the protests that evolved um, like by refugees and migrants and support organizations um, that like provided aid, but also um, like help to cross the channel um, in the early 2000s. Um, that is often forgotten. And I think it's very important. Um, and at that time I learned, okay, I'm not the first person to go there, but since the mid 1990s, it was and is a very um, important issues for social movements in the field, like in Northern uh, France, um, in um, Western Belgium and um, across like the channel in the UK. And so I think that is maybe one first perspective that we should not overestimate what is going on right now, but like contextualize um, both social movements um, and also make like the whole contestations about these issues, because usually there is a history behind it. And what we often see is that also researchers or activists are jumping on a train and going somewhere and thinking, oh, that's brand new, things are happening, great. Um, but I think that's the power of um, researchers, of research, and also um, like to look behind these um, newspaper headlines. And um, I think that is also something where um, researchers um, can provide um, some support for social movements, because when we contextualize um, like conflicts, um, like uh, that really can help like for um, like movements um, and, and struggles taking place um, right now. Um, and like in this phase of my PhD, um, I was very much and I'm still interested in, in a question of how weak actors can develop strategies um, that like are powerful. Um, so to, and this is a very old social movement question. Like I learned um, a lot from the civil rights movement in, in the United States and the weapons of the weak um, studies like much longer or like the history of slavery and slave revolutions. Um, so the, like, therefore, um, I think it's important to look at strategies um, and at actor constellations. So under which conditions do movements and relatively weak actors um, are able to develop um, a certain strength. Um, and I found uh, like as a feminist and a, a gender researcher, I found that at that time also women had a particular strength because in the early 2000s, the whole issue of gender mainstreaming was quite en vogue. Um, so also undocumented migrant women who experienced violence, for example, um, like they had a good argument in their hands. And I contrasted this 
feminist perspective, like of, of the strengths of the gender equality argument with the situation of the migrants and refugees at the channel, mainly male migrants, like who could not point like to good reasons why to cross the channel, except like for reasons that were not accepted. Like for example, going to, to family or having like to make a living. These arguments were not accepted and therefore, um, the migrants had to take additional risk and um, like walk through the channel or board um, like uh, lorries. Um, and so I think like this um, like it is also a very classical social movement theory question. So what are the resources and what are the strengths and the opportunities, um, the conditions under which actors can act as they do? Um, and I also learned a lot in Songat and Calais about um, space. Uh, so the specific space a movement is taking place in. So the borderlands in this case, and I'm sure uh, Salim will maybe say more about it because we have also in Lesbos or other regions, we have very specific spaces and, and places. Um, and so these spaces make things possible that and other places would be impossible. And that was the mass movement, well, mass relatively, um, to, to cross the channel. And so organized um, migrant action um, to like claim the right um, for movement. Um, so, and, and uh, like in the past weeks, I've really been thinking a lot of about my study and the PhD at that time, because I learned so much um, about um, contestations um, in space and on space and mobility. And um, I also like um, a second um, uh, research um, I would like to um, draw your attention to is the research and um, like on um, deportations and anti-deportation protests. And um, there like we learned like we, we were able like with a combination of qualitative and quantitative research, I think we will talk about methods later, um, to correct a perception about the anti-deportation protests, because for a long time it was perceived as like um, their NGOs or churches, church asylum, um, supporting um, migrants in not being deported. And at least for Germany and also a little Austria and Switzerland with um, our colleagues, Gianni D'Amato and Siglinde Rosenberger, uh, we could show that um, like migrants and refugees to be deported were actors themselves. But in the newspapers, there were no reports about these um, um, actions um, because like their protest means were considered acts of despair, such as um, like, um, being rebellious in, in airplanes and not wanting to be deported. And it was like the media coverage was very much, okay, there are the good Germans um, helping, supporting um, the refugees and the deportables, uh, depo deportees not to be deported. Um, but so I think also with a certain like combination of methods, we can um, see who is actually active and with maybe one method, it is not um, sufficient. So maybe as a third um, example, and that's for closing for this round, um, I would um, like to point um, to more recent research on like, like where we look at um, the um, changing nature of refugee support in Germany. And um, like where we like at IMES in Osnabrück, we have a couple of projects um, linking, um, like which are closely interlinked. And um, we try to better understand what is going on. Also to see like, for example, the biographies of, of activists. So how do they develop over time? And um, with my colleague Helge Schwierz and I, we found um, that there is a politicization of a lot of um, like maybe more humanitarian actors, church activists, like who had a very paternalistic or maternalistic um, perspective, but they really got angry over time because they see they saw, okay, their efforts um, are like don't work and refugees cannot come to Germany any longer. They're sitting in transit and um, like so that there are more and more um, actions towards um, the active support 
of fleeing, of crossing borders, um, also of clandestine border crossings. Um, and I think this is another thing I find important to not, like, as I mentioned before, not to have this, um, like to look at one point in time, but um, to follow a movement and to see how, um, how it changes, um, both in terms of um, demands, um, but also uh, in terms of, of action. And there we see how like one group takes this road, another takes another road. And um, I think this is very important to understand the contestations. And the final sentence, I really like the title of the workshop, um, like the contentious um, issue, which, which you address. So to like to, to look at different actors and to maybe implicitly also refer to Sidney Terrell's work of the contentious politics. Um, and so I'm very much looking forward to our discussion today. Yeah, thank you, Helen, for, for this uh, initial input and uh, rolling out the field here um, along these three examples of your own experience and work. I think, um, yeah, there are so many lamps at least clicking on in my head um, that I would like to hook in. But um, yeah, I would like uh, to ask Salim now to share um, yeah, maybe a little bit your background and also your approach and experience um, from, from the place that you are in and the things that you have done. Please, over to you. Thank you. Um, I would like to start it the other way around. I would like to start with my conclusions, what I learned over the years. And, and I would like to say that uh, to, in order to introduce that idea, I would like to say that, first of all, I, my work has been at an intersec interdisciplinary as everybody else, uh, but at an intersection of philosophy, particularly uh, the questions, Western philosophy questions of subjectivity on the one hand, political theory on the other hand, uh, forced migration on the other hand, and anti-authoritarian movements on the other which makes it a very complex milieu uh, and how to uh, reconcile them has been uh, quite a challenge for me. Uh, but let me start by saying that philosophically, at least, uh, and political theory aspect, I, my work or my conclusion of, of what I did over the last five years in Lesbos, uh, my conclusions uh, amount to at least to say that there's been a number of shifts theoretically in the last century. One has been a profound philosophical shift, uh, which has argued uh, that the self of the human, which since Plato and Aristotle in the West has been considered as the, as the ground for the human's authenticity and being and proper behavior, has been exposed as groundlessness. And that can be traced all the way to Hegel, but Nietzsche, Heidegger, and Jean-Luc Nancy, Derrida, Agamben, Foucault, I, I mean, I can give you details of it in, in the next round if you want. What I'm trying to say is that the philosophical shift showed in the last century, uh, uh, my, my bachelor was in, in philosophy, sorry, uh, if, if I kind of convolute things here, uh, but I always try to keep that also close to myself because it's important not to forget that we are part of the West and West is a globalized situation right now. We are, we are West is not exclusively European. Uh, uh, the, the petit bourgeois lifestyle of the West is actually a global phenomenon. So uh, to move forward, what I'm arguing based on my what I learned from the refugee activism on the island is that uh, I learned that philosophically, I, I could look back and, and find out that there was a fundamental shift, a shift from the idea of self to life. And, and we can find that already in, in the early, uh, in, the, in the later writings of Michel Foucault, but also Giorgio Agamben, Roberto Esposito, and, and it goes on even in the, uh, in the studies of uh, forced migration, 
it has been used, albeit I don't agree with the usages, but nevertheless, uh, I'll leave it at that. Another shift was uh, a shift that took place starting with uh, a Nazi jurist from Germany, Karl Schmidt, uh, who said that we need to study the political on its own terms, uh, 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 on the idea of the political. Uh, I suppose das Politische would be the German term. Uh, where Schmidt was focused on identity versus enemy. Uh, I find Hannah Arendt actually uh, providing in, in her book on uh, revolution uh, more suitable um, theoretical framework, which according to Arendt, the political means the transformative operation. Uh, and so in, in the last century, we also reflected, or at least say the West reflected on the idea of transforming society to a new polity, as Hannah Arendt calls it. Uh, last but not least, uh, there are two more points about the political theoretical aspects that I would like to speak because these are major shifts that were happening right around the middle of last century towards the last uh, to, towards the end. Uh, the other aspect was the move from classical to neoliberal politics, uh, uh, something that people like Foucault and many others have pointed out and it has been a cornerstone of, of critical theory or at least critical political theory, which goes back to, to uh, the debates that uh, German and Austrian um, uh, liberals had in this journal called Ordo. That's why they called them Ordo liberals. And they, they called for, if I'm not pronouncing it wrong, Gesellschaftspolitik, which has been translated as social policy. But, what I'm trying to say is in all of this, uh, and uh, then the last one would be uh, the emergence of theories of commons. And that was the a course that uh, I, I held at uh, Humboldt University through Off University this past spring, uh, which was on the idea of commons and living together, radical interventions from migrants in Lesbos. Uh, the emergence of theories of commons also emerged precisely at this kind of a juncture, at this historical juncture that I'm pointing out to you through philosophical and various political theories. Uh, why do I mention this is uh, very simple, because it was the study of, of refugees, uh, uh, the situation on this island to look at this uh, threshold subject, this the liminal subject of contemporary world. Uh, uh, because if the subject is defined by rights, then it means that the, uh, the contemporary subject is endowed with rights via certain legal procedures, uh, which of course means primarily the citizen that has political rights, uh, but the refugee arrives at the shores of, of Europe, so to speak, uh, but that, that applies also to United States, as we know, uh, to, some, to a great extent and other places. But let's stick to the European context. So for me, it was this look at the refugee as the threshold point, uh, uh, the, the, the liminal subject the subject that was barely any more subject, but still considered in some ways a subject that caused me to look at these theoretical perspectives of the West. So in a way, people have asked me, uh, what do you think of post-colonial theories? Uh, I don't know. I come from a post-colonial background. Uh, I don't know how much I need to engage with that. Uh, that's why I engage with colonialist theories, maybe <laughs> that, that works well. Uh, so I, I, I try, my work has been to use the situation that I find myself uh, and, and the, the observations that I make to reflect 
on the theoretical aspect. So in a, in a way, a, a manuscript that I'm working on, if you find any publisher that would be interested in the intersection of philosophy, political theory, and forced migration, please let me know. I would like to submit it. But other than that, uh, so uh, my, why did I start with the theoretical aspect was because my experiences and my research have allowed me to intervene into theory. And as a result, also, when I was teaching this course to intervene in the very pedagogy of, of migration studies. So, and why do I say that the refugees have allowed me? The refugee is, like I mentioned, is at the threshold, at the limit point of contemporary subjectivity with, with basically, and why, why do I say that? Uh, Already the, the 1951 convention and the European laws, including Greek laws, do not allow the refugee political participation. Political participation is excluded, explicitly excluded in 1951 convention. And so as such, if you take away the political ability of a refugee to determine or to participate in the determination of their lives, then we are talking really here about a decapitated subject, a subject that is not allowed to be completely a subject. That's why for me, the refugee is at the threshold, yet still because it has certain rights, at least legally speaking, it, we can consider it uh, as a potential subject or as a liminal subject, as I would like to say we'll get to the theoretical aspects, why I call it the liminal or threshold. But as Hannah Arendt noted in, uh, in on totalitarianism, uh, the refugee is the proper bearer of rights uh, because the refugee comes, arrives precisely with no other claim on rights except the claim to right to life. Right? So for me, between the refugee and the theoretical aspects that I briefly mentioned, the commonality is that there has been a sh profound shift, a profound shift between an idea of self and rights to the idea of life. And, and the refugee is the exemplar of that shift par excellence, I would say. Now, as far as it concerns me as an activist uh, and particularly as an activist who is inclined to uh, ideas of anti-authoritarian politics, if you want to call it like that. Uh, first of all, political movements within Europe uh, have no discourse on life. The discourse is about rights or about labor. Uh, if, if we are talking about refugees and migrants, we are talking about discourses on rights Without the discourse on life, if we are talking rights uh, discourses within Europe, it's about labor and labor rights and, and so on. So for me, as an activist, I, I have been challenging my fellow activists on the island who have been in support of refugees continuously since 2016. Uh, where's in your discourse the idea of life? Because I have to remind you that the right has already seized on the idea of, of life because one of the main discourses of the right is that our way of life is in danger. Yeah. Okay, um, Salem, if I may just interrupt here. Um, I think um, we do have in the second round, um, I think uh, a little bit more time to really go into, into the details of kind of um, not how you link basically um, the observation on your actual experiences and also your observation on the experience of um, in the whole field of, of um, mobilization um, and translating this into, um, yeah, theoretical interventions, as you call it, uh, and um, political theory. So it's, it seems uh, it's, 
yeah, I can see how it already speaks to Helen's research. And I'm sure now that I will ask Amila, um, she will actually contribute another um, dimension and aspect to it. So Anila, you are actually coming from an advocacy background poorly. Uh, maybe correct me if I'm wrong. But um, yeah, I was wondering, so what is your take um, on the topic of our discussion today? Um, how does your previous and also current work relate to it? Over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Katya. And thank you so much for my panel speakers. I really enjoyed and it's very much resonate and related, but Helen also mentioned and Salim, you mentioned about how this discussion, this course is very much linked. And as my own experience coming from a refugee background and advocacy background on the policy. So we are actually trying to change with the name, if I always cherish, is transformation. So we are talking about the transformation. We are talking about the transformation as an embedded knowledge by refugees themselves and how they are trying to change. And this advocacy is part of everything. Either we are trying to change the policies, we are trying to come up with the knowledge, who has the power of knowledge, who has the uh, say something in the research even. And I think this is very much linked the theme uh, and even the title, if I say is transformation of knowledge and influence how we can keep connect with the humanitarian theory, uh, the humanitarian approach, and how we can come up with more solution. Because if you see how policy works, how uh, decision works, they always relay on the dependent on the research. So research provide evidence-based uh, suggestion or advice. So that's why it's very important to be part of this research, to be part of this decision, and the, to come up with more close and refugee-led data. Because when we see, in the, if I give the example of global compact of refugees and uh, last um, uh, from last few years, uh, starting in 2016 and uh, 17, when we have a so-called refugee crisis, we saw they become more uh, related to the our discussion, which we are having today. So in global compact of refugees and global compact of migration, why they even come up with these new, uh, you know, frames, because uh, the convention of 1951 was felt to be outdated, felt not to be uh, um, a more context with the regional uh, context, regional updated realities, especially the local realities. That's why they come up with these new frameworks. And we me, myself, as a refugee advocate for the policy change, we are more trying to influence of the global compact of refugees. And in last few years, we come up to make of meaningful participation. This kind of a new approach we are bringing. And we saw in new uh, um, the New Year declaration, which happened in 2016, and the General Assembly, they agreed to be put refugee and migrants' voices there in this domain because they 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 felt the co global compact can't be create more impact if we do not in, include refugee either is research either is implementation i either is come up with a recommendation even even highlighting the gaps because if you see um it's very easy if you go and see okay is it working or not working we do the consultation uh, with the target groups and in, in this discussion, if we unfortunately couldn't understand their defined problems, we can't translate accordingly. And then maybe there could be some uh, gaps left in, even in the, the data or in the coming or the accurate solution. That's why as a refugees advocate, we are trying to be involved um, in to outline uh, recommendation, to outline research, to outline uh, policy debate. So that's the work which we are trying to do. And we are come up with a slogan. It sounds like a very activist, but as I said, I'm an activist person, but I'm trying to understand how we can uh, complement the research advocacy and the policy with each other. So we come up with a slogan of nothing about us without us. And it's becoming so much close 
uh, in a meaningful uh, participation in the debate right now. And next week, I will be participating uh, in the Global Compact of Refugee. And there, actually, uh, UNHCR, uh, UN agencies, and other multi stakeholders, they are trying to track the so uh, far the uh, discussion is just happening, how we can see it is helping or not, especially how COVID magnify the vulnerabilities of refugee communities. We can't ignore this impact. So we really need to understand um, the, even the new debate of vaccine, the right of vaccine, which vaccine we can be you know, recognized even in Europe context. So this all coming together to know the embedded knowledge is fairly important. So I'm happy to be part of this discussion. Katia, over to you. Yeah, thank you, Anila. Um, yeah, I think since um, the time is just running, I would like to actually, um, yeah, directly go to the second round um, and hope we will hear also then enter a discussion more. Um, and here I would like to focus uh, really on the how question that is also in the title of our um, podium today. So how do we study contention over migration and political mobilization for rights? And um, Anila, because you were just talking about it um, and mentioned also you know, your, your movement slogan, nothing about us. Uh, without us um, and that you would really like to see you know, um, like a stronger connection as I understand you between really research and also the involvement of refugees in research displaced people um, for producing evidence which will then be fed into um, yeah policy recommendations and so on so I would like to ask you Actually, um, maybe, yeah, if it's not asked too much, could you give us some examples or, for example, yeah, have you been able to make use of particular scholarly debates um, to substantiate your own arguments or maybe even you know, if, if we take your, um, your slogan series, then, um, yeah, we need a lot of refugees um, actually conducting research and this then concerns maybe also um, the field of methodology. So what how have you been trying to um, yes yeah, to substantiate your research um, with um, yeah with evidence uh, sorry your your policy outreach with evidence um, what did you find useful now how can migrant movement really conflate with political movement in the sense that you know, we display or you display a, a transformative potential and agenda. So that's why immediately back to you actually. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Katia, for this second. I, I think as I mentioned in recent years, there has been strong, uh, you know, uh, drive become encouraging refugees and even the debate which refugees discussion happen, they, they know we need to involve in a meaningful way. Uh, in, as a, deci uh, a decision making process and how we can uh, bring these various forms of refugee participation. Uh, if you know, uh, we as a refugees, we, we are uh, trying to unpack these spaces even where this participation happened in which spaces. So they're so far, unfortunately, invited based spaces, which is very close. And if you see the name high level official meeting is already saying, okay, this high level official meeting, what does it mean? So we are trying to unpack this course uh, analysis using this kind of discourse analysis to define, okay, what is participation, what is not participation, and what is meaningful participation according to us, and how we can give the understanding in this debate to the policymaker to unpack tokenization, to unpack reproduction of uh, uh, exploitation and even to give them uh, accountability lens like it is working or not it's like how we can come up uh, you know uh, face um, uh, intention uh, involving refugee in way in which way and you mentioned about how because now after uh, these two years of covid we felt this how question is the most important right now it's like, again, we really need to implement because policy debates, uh, recommendation, and uh, all even uh, very good research, unfortunately, be so far away to the reality. The implementation get lost. Then uh, uh, when it comes to the implementation to each context, to each countries, it get lost. And we are trying to make sure how we can make sure the implementation need to be accountable and 
has to be right started from bottom up approach and then how we can generate whole of a society but on an equal participation and uh, i hope uh, in upcoming months with my uh, stay in uh, big i really looking forward how we can see the transformation of power you know knowledge power and how we can use this power cubic approach power within power two and power four this i'm really trying to understand to work on because refugees unfortunately their identity is more linked with vulnerabilities and when we are thinking about vulnerabilities we think those communities has nothing to contribute and that's what we are trying to change we are saying we are resilient we are contributor as a partner so yes we are vulnerable but system is making us vulnerable our communities who are on the move or not in the move uh, you know people even in the Yemen in Syria Belarus situation and Afghanistan there's so many communities who are affected by conflict affected by this and they are similar in this situation they are dying they're poor and they need our help but how we make a mechanism to help them instead of making them more vulnerable I hope I can answer your question Yes, um, thank you, Anila. From um, what I, what I take away is a little bit um, that um, yeah you are asking these questions um, to yourself, and now your fellowship maybe is also the opportunity to get more clarity about it. But I was um, actually reading in Helen's answer already in the first um, round of questions. She was already pointing out that uh, research time and again has tried to make this point that. Um, no, it's not the vulnerability which is uh, most important maybe to see um, um, no, if, if you look at refugees but that they actually um, are um, agents of change and do also have this transformative potential and apparently there is a gap um, of um, yeah making policy makers and maybe even people in, in I'm not sure social movement uh, yeah, in the social movement field to understand um, that this is really the case and how, how this can be um, can be supported in terms of maybe we're talking, I think, about strategies and strategic action here. So that's why I would also like to now hand over to Helen and um, can I ask you maybe to reflect also on, on, on two things here in the second round of how do we study um, contention over migration? So on the one hand side, the, um, the underlying theoretical and conceptual lenses um, that you have used and that you attribute particular analytical value here. So for example, um, I'm not sure to what extent you perceive also disciplinary boundaries, theoretical toolboxes, you know, for example, between forced migration studies, social movement scholarship, political science, or other interdisciplinary fields, such as maybe also conflict studies um, into, uh, as competing or siloing or cross-fertilizing. And then, yeah, if you could also say something um, on your experience with, with what is a useful methodology, uh, methods for um, studying particular contentious issues about forced migration. Over to you, Helen. Okay, thank you. <laughs> so many questions. And yeah. uh, I would just pick some um, like, thoughts or present some thoughts and the first one is on disciplines and um, like when I prepared myself for today I browse okay what are the newest publications in the field and I was thinking like okay I'm coming from interdisciplinary discussions so I'm very much used to it um, in the social sciences mainly sociology political science gender studies and that fits quite nicely together usually especially when you're coming from a post positivist perspective like working with Foucauldian approaches well sometimes they don't fit to structural approaches so um, I have like I come from a context working also with Gramsci's ideas um, about hegemony and I try to give it more a uh, post structuralist twist um, with the idea like um, like about um, like knowledge production and also the like that it makes a difference which frames are used in movements so that is something that also Anila mentioned I think like um, it really makes a difference whether you talk um, like um, like how do you talk about subjects also Sally mentioned that um, 
Yeah, but where I saw, like when I, I browsed the, like recent publications, I came across um, publications from social psychology and studies that um, interviewed, um, I think it was 1,200 um, like activists from several European countries and try to identify factors that make people becoming an activist. Um, and like with this kind of research, I sometimes have some issues. And I don't find it completely uh, convincing because it has like it, it draws like very clear um, conclusions, like what are the conditions under which psychological um, like like um, conditions is someone developing a feeling of compassion or of solidarity. Um, and I think like there is not much discussion between like um, more political science, sociological discussions, maybe also in political theory and social psychology, like um, also the methods differ so much. Um, and um, sometimes I'm a bit clueless also how to how to bridge it. On the other hand, there has been in social movement studies a long tradition also of social psychology. And when we go back to also um, critical Frankfurt School of thinking, like there are uh, ways of maybe getting some good inspirations. But with today's social psychology, that is often something like else because it, it might have a quite positivist um, take on the issue. Um, so experience with methods. Um, uh, yeah, I said like usually I like to combine different methods, taking into account their strengths and weaknesses. And also like I um, work a lot also with media, um, like to identify events, for example. I find that very helpful, like to, to, ident to make a, an event history, so to say, like um, to, to see what happened and um, like which actors have been involved. It usually also slogans um, you can find in media or in photos. And then to combine it also with uh, qualitative interviews and with observations. Um, and I think just one method is usually not sufficient um, to fully understand it. And I would like to extend it to the ethical question. Um, and maybe that is also a link to what Anila said. I found it super interesting what was you said about um, refugee-led data. And I would love to learn more about it. Because um, sometimes, like when we do observations or interviews in sensitive fields where people maybe like with whom we do interviews or have conversations, um, like are in a very precarious situation and um, like maybe often it's better not to do interviews um, because either it takes their time or it provides additional stress or additional um, efforts. Um, and um, like I'm thinking about alternatives to doing interviews and also in like with with people maybe whose situation is changing very quickly because maybe in one point in time an interview does not mean a lot of risk but maybe half a year later the person is under like perceived threat threats um, so how do we take into account these changing um, environments for um, also exiled um, activists um, and yeah, that's maybe my question for Anila to, to um, like, I'm very curious what this uh, refugee-led data could mean. Does it mean also like, for example, to, to collect data in, I don't know, detention camps about like living conditions there or in situations, what, what it, the experiences maybe of refugees with border controls, with pushbacks, um, or is that maybe better if there are external observers or both. Um, so I would like to discuss that further with maybe the panel and maybe also the audience has some ideas on that. Yeah, great. Thank you, Helen. Um, Anita, are you ready to um, answer right away? Then I could. Yeah, sure. Uh, but my answer will be very short, maybe. Uh, oh, yeah. it, 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 it says that for us as a refugee representative or involved uh, 
yes, when we are saying, so we could use, a, you know, participatory approach. When we go the basic participatory approach, it's, it's meaning really how we can co-design and even to understand and build the right question with the communities. That's very important. And I always give the example, especially nowadays, I've been taking the example, why we say women's rights are human rights. It's a very thing, women's are, women are human rights, but why we focus and we say women's rights are human rights because it means we want to focus right away by saying this slogan, you know, like, okay, we are really try to focus on the women's issues. That's why we are using this slogan. Similar like this, when we are saying it's a refugee-led organization, refugee-led research, it means we are giving the focus starting from beginning, from the very first step. We recognize them, their value, we re recognize their involvement, and we are trying to make and create mechanism, how we can involve, and we will ma make sure whatever we do, they have an equal partnership in even equal, uh, you know, evaluation. And if you see, if I can give you the example right now, there's so many new, I, I would say, uh, new trend of ma making refugees representative as advisory board members, as a board members, as a advisory roles voluntarily, but are is meaningful. Do they have power to make a decision? Do they have the influence to make the decision? Or do they have so again, is if you see the participation ladder, somehow we felt we are stuck on consultations. So how we can go beyond consultation and it's a mechanism to engage refugees and migrants. And that's why I'm saying in Europe con context is more complex. And when we are talking in Europe, we always talk about migrants because we can't talk about migration or forced migration, but in the global South or developing countries, there we are talking about refugees how we can but is is this again maybe I'm, i thought i will be go to a short answer but it's become a long but the identities even for me sometimes we thought like these identities to so these groups are stateless this group are undocumented these are refugees and migrant so this all identities making this issue more complex instead of getting easy answers providing more solution it's becoming more critical and complex. Yeah, thank you, um, Anila. That was uh, not too long for an answer. And I think it was very fascinating because you could really um, yeah, give us several um, substantial points here on um, yeah, how you really proceed and um, what, what is really no, the, the core of actually the problem and, and the issue. And I would um, like to give um, Salem, who has uh, been working very closely also on this, um, yeah, as I understand at least from, from your background on this um, kind of translation of um, yeah, refugee concerns into, into academia, at least. I think yours is not so much the, the link to um, already the policy field, but I think you have, um, you have done um, yeah, a lot to, uh, to think about possibilities to include refugees in actually producing um, yeah, research evidence, scientific evidence. And I would really like to um, ask you to share this experience here with us. And um, yeah, basically there we've also um, answered this question. Um, what, what do you think about this? Um, yeah, methodological field. Uh, what 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 is useful in in your view? And actually, I was I was wondering whether you would be a proponent of uh, of a strict binary between uh, theory and methodology, or whether you would actually have a different take on uh, how theory and methodology relate in this field. So, Salem, over to you, please. Thank you. Um, so let me start by saying that um, I, I told you I will tell you the story backwards. Uh, and so now I am pretty much at the, at the beginning of the story. From 2016 onward, when the EU-Turkey statement came into place in 
in Greece and European Union, uh, refugees. And, and here is something I, I, I really like what Anila mentioned, because for me, they are all refugees. There's no question of migrants. Uh, and this is because I have also another comment to make. Uh, <laughs> Why does a British person or a German person coming living in Greece is called expatriate, and 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 the the mic you know the, the, we distinguish between uh, global South migrants and refugees. I mean, if there is any one migrant, then it's the British guy or the German guy or person living in Greece. Uh, the others are all refugees because they are looking for a refuge. They are looking for a shelter. I mean, sorry to say it in, in blatant uh, linguistic terms. I mean, if, if we're going to talk about refugees, then we're talking about people who are looking for sh shelter and a refuge. So uh, as, as Anila said, uh, I, or, or let's say if I would respond to that, I would say that I consider them all, first of all, refugees. Uh, because they are all looking for refuge, uh, just, to, just to start with that. Now, in terms of researching and how to, how to, how to make these experiences, and, and I don't like the idea of experiences because always journalists and researchers come to this island and they stop the refugees and they interview them and I've interpreted for many of them. And they're like, oh, tell me about your experiences. No, maybe this refugee has a theory, uh, but that doesn't cross these people's mind because we live in this kind of a hierarchical Western ideal theorist and, and, and the refugee that has only experiences. Huh? And so from my point of view, this has been a very problematic issue about the ethos or as, as, as Helen uh, mentioned, the ethics of research. What is the, you know, in, I, I discovered this in Greece, uh, the ethos means the proper place actually, it has nothing to do with morality. So what is the proper place of, of ethics, uh, of, of, of research, let's say. And, and I found that we have a problem here in terms of research. And, and that's that we always take this kind of position of objectivity. We, we believe that we go in and we have a neutral position. There is no neutral position. The academy historically has been in the service of power and capital. Like let's not forget who was funding people who were doing research, uh, including today. Uh, so uh, the academy is subservient to power. And as such, this position of objectivity Activity does not for me exist. I, so as a result, I when I arrived in, in Lesbos, when I started my research in 2016, in July 2016, I, I applied two methods, uh, uh, in which I would recommend to anyone coming to Lesbos at least. Uh, the first one was a, a phenomenological approach, what I would call. I didn't come here with a question. I didn't come with a policy objective. I didn't come with a hypothesis. I came to let that phenomena itself disclose what is at question, what is at stake here. And it showed a lot of things. One of the things that it showed was the difference between humanitarianism and solidarity and political movements in Greece. And that doesn't exclude the rest of Europe. I'm, I'm talking here also about movements such as no border movement which is highly German based actually. Uh, so uh, there, there was a fundamental difference between these two approaches between NGOs working and, and trying to perpetuate the same ideas uh, like some of the things like participatory research, participatory research action, uh, action research. Uh, and there was also the, the activist movement, uh, uh, which was highly radical, but, uh, but also highly welcoming, not stigmatizing refugees, not having, throwing bags of diapers and, and, and things like that at them just because they had now funding. Uh, in, in contrast, these people were actually politicizing 
the refugees. I'm not saying that the refugees had no potential, but it was this consciousness learning about what politics in Europe is, what European borderlessness, uh, what the EU as a borderless entity means to Europeans versus what it means to a non-European. So this kind of an uh, information that was being passed around was really radicalizing and it, or at least politicizing, you could say, the refugees. So as, as the activism really started in the aftermath of uh, 2016 uh, uh, EU-Turkey statement, which basically made the refugees prisoners on the island, uh, refugees started to mobilize and, and they were really mobilizing. But how, what kind of a research do you apply when you're going there? The traditional participatory action research. Uh, well, which refugee do you prefer here? I mean, I mean PAR has had serious problems and uh, they've been noted sufficiently enough. I don't need to get into that. So what I applied was uh, what is known as militant research. Uh, uh, so militant research says that, uh, or to quote uh, uh, Collectivo Zituaciones from Argentina, uh, uh, militant research is not a politics that organizes life, but it's a life that disorganizes politics. So I applied that by participating directly in, in these actions from uh, sit-ins to squads to, um, I, I don't want to name specifics too much except one I will mention. The, uh, one of the very important ones was an occupation of, of the governing uh, party in Greece, Syriza uh, party. Uh, the uh, 35 refugees, in addition to some 55 local young Greeks, uh, participated together in occupying for the rights of these 35 refugees to leave the island. So, at the time when this, this was impossible to do. And it was one of the most successful uh, political actions ever on this island. And the reason I'm, I'm, I'm mentioning this is because when we are talking about political mobilization, as I mentioned earlier, uh, we have to understand that political mobilization is about life. And, and with a Greek young 22 year old university student, let's say, as an example, uh, they have a very close affinity of understanding how European policies affect their lives destroy their families, destroy their potentials for future, because let's not forget 2015 and, and Greek financial crisis where uh, that all that happened. So between the anti-authoritarian movement, which is predominantly caused, uh, composed uh, from, um, you know, uh, young university students, usually young people, let's say, uh, generally below 40 years old, uh, and refugees, there was this fundamental solidarity in, in those years. And for me, in order to study such political mobilization, which can be effective, and which will literally take the battle to the doorsteps of power, not just through some kind of representation, but really the refugee, the 35 refugees being in the squad. Uh, so not being represented, but being personally present. Uh, there's a difference between representation and presentation here. Uh, I think uh, for me, it, first of all, that is not only possible, that is taking place, but the problem is how do we study it? Uh, the study of it requires a kind of a discre discretion uh, that will protect them throughout the years. And, and throughout the time. And as, uh, as, as uh, the question of ethics was concerned, I, I would like to say that 
and militant research requires a different ethics, as an ethics that goes beyond what we know today in university. It's not about a confirmed, uh, informed cons consent. It's about friendship. It's about trust in each other. You need to gain the trust of that refugee to be able to trust you in this action. You, you cannot just have a cons informed consent form signed. That, that means nothing to the refugees. And, and I've seen many anthropologists and sociologists here on the island for whom I have interpreted and translated uh, who come and the refugees give them very interestingly enough staged answers. And I, and I respect them because they're playing the, uh, the academic as much as the academic plays them. Because at the end of the day, the academic is making a career here. Uh, so let's not forget our power position and with which we are utilizing lives. We are, we are abusing almost lives for our careers. And we forget that part. And refugees are not blind to that. And rightfully so, I would say. So I will leave it at that. Sorry, I, I keep on going on. Yeah, thank you, Salem. Um, I'm really tempted to ask you, um, so beyond you know, the issue of trust that you kind of emphasize um, you know, when we speak about that we need to kind of reinvent, or maybe not reinvent, but just maybe a different type of ethics. Um, yeah, but, but there's other techniques or other things that you have maybe, um, yeah, that, that you can already share. I think you have, um, you have yourself kind of designed this uh, curriculum and this course, no? Um, that you have not really talked about yet. So maybe um, maybe you can do that in the last round. I know that the time is running. We have 20 minutes left. I would really like to also um, open up for the for the audience here um, that is uh, bearing with us. But maybe um, before we do that, um, for the uh, for the for the final round for comments and questions. Um, I would like to ask each of you um, very briefly um, for the main gaps that you see, that you identify um, in your work um, and shortcomings um, concerning the scholarship of uh, contestation over migration and rights. Um, and maybe, um, yeah, Helen, can I ask you first, um, because you were already hinting that uh, you have prepared some some kind of reflection on this. Um, so what, what is your take on this? Where, where do you see kind of work that needs to be done that uh, has not been sufficient yet? Yeah, thank you. Um, and I would maybe like to start with a question to Salim um, because I'm like, I think one problem, one critical issue in today's social movement field in like on, on refugee issues is, that the research is done either in big cities, in global cities, or in emblematic um, islands like Lesbos or other fields. So why do you do research in Lesbos and maybe not on another island where maybe the situation is, is similar, but um, it is less visible in public and also um, because I think like this focus on on the prominent cases has some like has some positive and some negative effects. I think a positive one is that maybe in these places there are critical places where things happen and you can show things like in like in in, in one condensed like situation you can explain a lot of things how it happens how it evolved and and the symbolics about it um, but on the other hand a lot of situations are not seen which are maybe equally interesting both in theory and in empirical terms and like one a conclusion maybe like we draw like for a project that we're like having right now is not to focus on the big cities, but on mid-sized cities, um, because we see that social interactions in smaller cities differ quite a bit uh, from what is happening in Berlin or Hamburg. And there are dozens of studies on Berlin and Berlin is so unique, um, like in, in the German context. And maybe we can extend it, like say it's, it's like in London or Copenhagen or Paris, like why do so many studies focus on these um, big cities? Um, yeah, and I think um, like another thing is like, um, 
some studies like like um, are conducted by activist scholars and that is also um, has some pros and cons like the um, the good thing like also um, Salim um, said about militant research and uh, what we have learned from a lot of like militant research in Latin America is that you really that it is a different type of research so it's very in-depth it's very engaged um, so um, and and it provides also some um, like benefits for the movements because like the knowledge that is produced is produced from within so it is it differs very much from okay 10 conclusions from our ad or advocacy points um, like from whatever research um, project um, but on the other hand um, like um, like other experiences where maybe less activist researchers are based um, like remain invisible um so like like i don't know i guess salim also has um thought a lot about um like his position in less wars like with like um yeah maybe that's i just leave it for now yeah salim i think um you have been directly addressed by helen with the question and um, yeah, that's why I would like to hand the floor over to you and um, yeah, ask you to maybe share some of the reflections that you likely have had a lot of um, about your own positionality on Lesbos. Okay, so I would like to start by responding to Helen by saying that uh, I just live here. And, and so I, since I'm living here and the whole world, so to speak, landed here. Uh, <laughs> I might as well research, uh, and 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 I have to be very honest about this. Huh? Uh, we researchers, we always forget to be very uh, honest about our opportunistic positions. Uh, when this situation was happening, uh, of course, deep inside, let me be very honest. I thought this was goldmine for social research in every respect, from NGOs to uh, activist movements to state policies and so on. And it has been a gold research. Uh, it, it, it's has been a goldmine. So it was an opportunistic situation, but it happened so as it happened. So <laughs> it was uh, it was not my focus to uh, to particularly focus on Lesbos because Lesbos was so high profile. But I, I, I would like to continue on that note by saying that uh, over the years, I've seen also a big problem about how people research. People come here for three weeks, uh, for three weeks. They In three weeks, they cannot even find their way around five small little streets in the little center of this town. Uh, if I would tell them I will meet you on this street, they will not find it because they don't know it. But they leave after three weeks with this minimal and superficial approach and go out and write entire papers that affect policy, that affect decisions, politicians, but also public perceptions of things, including academic perceptions. Huh? So I think one of the things, uh, one of the reasons I didn't want to move to another island or another smaller place was because I was so engaged in this place from, from locals to everybody else that it was important for me to see all the different di dimensions. People come here as if there, is, there are only refugees on these islands. No, there are also locals here. Uh, and they have also been influenced by the situation. So uh, for me, that these have been the two reasons why I have stuck with Lesbos since 2016. And, and I'm not planning to, of course, I, I always keep on, you know, keeping an eye on, on different parts, particularly Germany uh, and borders regions. But really, that's, that's the reason. I, I, I don't want to be a three week tourist. Uh, you know, in, in, in Lesbos, we have developed, we have contributed two words, at least to say, to say the least, two words to the English dictionary that Oxford Dictionary needs to still mention. One of them is called volunteers, uh, holiday volunteers. And the other one is holidarians, holiday solidarians. <laughs> so uh, just, just to mention that, I didn't want to become one of those. Uh, it is important. I do take research seriously. 
But nevertheless, I also believe that the shortcoming of research on political mobilizations have been to undermine, as uh, Anila mentioned earlier, to undermine, and, and Helen as well, to undermine the potential of, of refugees themselves. Uh, the theoretical perspectives that I contribute to this, um, uh, which I did through my thesis and hopefully through a uh, manuscript, they didn't come just from me. I, I had read those books of Agamben, Esposito, Heidegger, Hegel years ago. It was me coming into this situation, me seeing them struggling and uh, in friendship. And, and if uh, you ask uh, another question about uh, how to go about it, let me uh, give you a brief but last word. You know about the ethics, uh, one of the most neglected passages in uh, Aristotle's Nicomachean ethics is a passage in which he uh, describes friendship. And he says friendship is a synesthesis of life, a co-sensing, a mutual sensing of life, of the sweetness of life. And he says, but in order to have friendship, you need to live together. The problem of research has been that researchers have not lived together. And we researchers from the West, we don't go to live together with them, to share the concerns, to share the traumas, to share the, the uh, difficulties that they are doing. In order for research to have actually a success, we need to have a season, as, uh, as Aristotle would say, as a co-living, a living together, in, which allows us to also finally co-sense and mutually sense and sense together the sweetness of life. And maybe we will have a better understanding of what refugees go through on these transitory islands that they go to. Thank you, uh, Salem. Then um, because the time is running, I just really have to um, cut you off here. But um, I would like to link your last comment really to, um, to give An Anila the last chance maybe also to react to these questions of shortcomings. Because, um, and I would like to ask you whether actually what Salem has uh, stressed now that um, maybe it would help if there was a real kind of no, co-sharing uh, of space and co-living of researchers with um, refugees. Um, would this help in your view or um, what is your take? Yeah, thank you. Um, yes, I would like to add on, uh, as uh, Salim mentioned about very correctly, like we become expert by doing research on them. Unfortunately, we are not taking them as expert. We are just taking their them as a refugees. I mean, them refugees as a data and how we make sure uh, it happens uh, so many times with me, especially in 2015 and 16, uh, when uh, I was uh, living in the camp. And so far, then I started working in a policy in the city of Amsterdam and later on. And now we have received so many requests to give interviews, to give, um, uh, you know, uh, our reflection and still now new request is getting to be part of their advice reward. And it's just like a trend, other trend. And uh, I always question that, okay, I like to be, see the name, my, what I'm saying, to have a proper reference. So we, as a refugee advocating to have our say as a proper reference, not as a one refugees, a woman from this and there, because this is providing a hollow kind of expression. Okay, who, when we are talking about refugee, would it actually really link humanitarian approach and to link with we are talking about humans. So that's why I'm so much interested and I'm trying to struggle how we can come up with the researchers as a research uh, to help us as a refugees to advocate what we are saying because the research will help us to see uh, the intersectional lengths which is uh, overlapping and the very much shortcoming being a coming from conservative countries like Pakistan it was shocked for me when I see in a forced migration in Europe there's so much lack the refugee women voices are still underrepresented. There's a huge gap to understand refugee women's uh, uh, difficulties by them. 
So that's what also I am doing uh, with my feminist lens and with my gender, uh, you know, advocate. We are need to being, do you, you know, the vulnerability question, which I always say, how we can making them more like a hidden and uh, giving burden on them of this expectation from them that they are vulnerable. But refugee women, especially, they are leading and they are controlling so much. And we need to give the visibility in our research. Yeah, thank you for this um, also very important point. Um, I would uh, briefly now um, give the audience a chance. Actually, there have been many questions asked that we have already moved to the section answered um, because um, yeah, implicitly and explicitly in some of the points we have been discussing, um, um, yeah, the questions were answered. And um, I still have open um, for Salim a question from one listener, um, why you treat refugees as one single category. Uh, you know, you would, he's um, mentioning that you use the term refugee and forced migrant interchangeably. So. Um, um, would you like to briefly kind of comment on this? Uh, well, the, the reason I do that is to uh, counter this whole debate that has existed in Europe since 2015, to say the least, between migrant and refugee. So the refugee is the deserving and the migrant is not the deserving. The migrant is coming for a better life. The refugee is just running for life. For me, they are both looking for life, and uh, and and maybe I were I was not throw enough, but that, that, that's a long story. I have to do a, <laughs> uh, send you my thesis. But the question is, uh, for for me, what the refugee as a threshold or liminal subjectivity of today brings to to the front for all of us to think about, and I think COVID has. The fact that we are not in person and we are uh, online is, is a good uh, uh, grounding for thinking about that. How life is at the center of the operations of power, and that means the operations of power in the global south, uh, uh, let's not forget that, that has been in the making for a long time. So when, I, when we are talking about when I say everyone is a refugee, for me, the question between an Afghan refugee who, who is just fleeing perhaps general violence in Afghanistan, but whose country was precisely the borders of Afghanistan were drawn by the British Empire. Let's not forget that uh, in, 19, uh, in 1884, 94, all the way to 1904, uh, there was a commission by the uh, British Empire called the Afghan Territorial uh, Commission uh, that was defining the borders of this country. So that Afghan refugee fleeing from there compared to an Iranian refugee, let's just to compare to two population whose language I speak and I've met many of them on this island over the years. Uh, so in 1953, it was uh, because a prime minister of, uh, at that time, the, uh, uh, Mossadegh uh, was Iran's president who wanted to nationalize oil. Uh, and it was actually the British and uh, Western, let's be very explicit because the CIA actually published their secret documents a couple of years ago on this issue in 1953, they staged a coup d'etat in Iran to change the government. And the result of it is an Islamist government that is now being a problem. So what, when I say refugee, in all forms and formats, these people are seeking refuge in a place, which is called Europe, that has directly influenced the very life for the last couple of centuries. Yeah. Uh, if not, uh, so for me, when I say they are all refugees, it's not to categorize between different kinds of refugees. But for me, they are all looking for a possibility of life, a possibility of life that was taken away in their own place. 
I think the message is, um, or the answer has been uh, very clear, Salim. Um, thank you so much for that. And I'm really sorry that I, I really have to end now the, the podium discussion. Um, we have come to an end. The time has run um, too fast, um, like it's always the case. Um, but I think um, in light of tomorrow's workshop that will take place and um, give um, ample opportunity maybe to um, really speak um, more in detail about certain cases on the one hand, but also the ethical and the methodological question on the other. Um, I feel that we have kind of maybe triggered um, food for thought here. Um, I feel that also that at least the usual biases that are um, you know, that, that events like these are critiqued for that there is a global north bias or an uh, a historic bias or some kind of um, yeah, other bias, I feel that um, our discussion here today has um, already from, from, you know, from you as um, panelists here on the podium has already kind of neutralized very many of these biases. So we have to, we have discussed ways of including uh, refugee voices and um, uh, not only in academia, but also in, uh, in policy dialogues. And um, I hope that we can kind of deepen the discussion tomorrow. And um, then I would now like to close the event. Um, but before we really say goodbye to everybody, I would like to ask uh, to thank my colleagues, Anne Christine, Komas, Maya Forman, and Marit Team, who have done here a great job for the technical support. And um, yeah, I hope to see you then tomorrow. Um, at We start at 10 a.m. Um, for, for the workshop. And again, a big thanks to to you, Helen, Anila, and Salem, for this very, very interesting exchange today. Okay. Have a nice evening. Bye bye.